to me, one of the biggest red flags is that guy who's throwing the overtop parties and basically having to scream that I have money usually means that that, that to me is like number one red flag. Okay. The other red flags that I, that I see with, you know, with syndicators is how many deals has he done in the last year? How many deals is he doing all over the place? Can he focus? Remember. Track record. Not track record so much because you can do bad deals. Mm-hmm. Right? If a syndicator comes to you and tells you, you know, I've only made money on my deals and I've had a 25% return, this and that, it means he hasn't been through a down cycle or he's burning money. Right? <laughs> right? Welcome back to the Kosher Money Podcast. This is a first for us, real estate investing, and we're hoping to do a few episodes on real estate. Not every term in this episode is easy to understand, but we did our best trying to explain it. If there's a term or a minute or two that's lost on you, keep going or pause and you can Google. We'll be right here waiting for you when you get back. There's some really good nuggets and stories in this episode. We sat with two professionals. One works very heavily in the real estate space, and hopefully this episode helps you grow your money but more importantly, maybe it helps you not lose your hard-earned money in a bad investment. I love that our two guests did not see eye to eye in everything, and I think that's very healthy and important, especially in a conversation like real estate. Let us know what you're gonna wanna hear in a future episode. Tell us what we got right, tell us what we got wrong. Hit the YouTube comment section. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. An entire episode on real estate. We've done health insurance. We've done investing, budgeting. People have been clamoring for an episode. So we're here with Joseph Kahn, Yudi Goldfein, and a whole lot of words that I really don't understand too much. But... I'm excited about this episode because not only this has been something that people want to hear, it's something that personally interests me, but I think it needs to be like a 101 and a 102, and I'm sure we can sit here for hours. So, uh, Joseph, we'll start with you. Who are you? Why are you sitting here? How'd you get into this? What's your social security number? Just run, run, run us through. So the 30-second version of that is I started a company called YK Group development consulting around eight years ago mm-hmm. um, that morphed into a company called Vision RE Realty Advisors. So we started out, I came from the not-for-profit world. I used to work in BMG under Aaron Cutler doing development work. So I was the okay. head director of campus development and planning. And then around eight years ago, I went out on my own and was assisting developers. And from there, I came to the point like, you know, someone would come to us with a project. We do a lot of project management. And I'd be, he'd ask me, okay, should I go into this project? Let's do the diligence on it. And we were giving away the diligence work to get the project management. So we said, okay, why don't we start just doing the diligence as well? And then we had a client who liked our work and asked us, okay, can you do the diligence on a multifamily property? And from there, you know, we're now a team of all people. Um, we've done work just in the last year in 36 different states. We've done every type of real estate for different clients. So I have single family homes that they're looking to buy for themselves. I won't get involved in that. But anything, everything in between, you know, we have a team of underwriters, we have a team that does just the diligence, we have a team that, you know, walk every property. We work for not only people looking at it for investments, we also work for a lot of companies for owner-occupied stuff. So, um, like, we have a company that we're working for now that does uniforms, so we've done work for Flom's Catering. You know, we've done work for a lot of those type of clients where we're helping them figure out what the real estate needs are. So, as a company, we're really doing the full gamut. I think one of the things that would be exciting to have for people is like we also work for, let's say, people who are putting money into deals. Does it make sense? Mm. And we have a whole roster of clients who won't take a move without asking us. And we're sitting there and looking at the deals that they're thinking about investing in. I mean, every deal I've always heard about has been a home run. So. Yeah. There's, you, know, you don't hear about the other ones. Yeah. Right. right. You know, math doesn't lie. Excel does. Okay. I, I can make any deal look good in Excel. Uh-huh. You know, I had a deal... I think this is like when we first started really doing the diligence for lenders, where a fund came to us and like, okay, we have this deal. We're thinking about putting money in ground up construction. And what, it didn't take me more than five minutes to realize that the, when he, the guy did the math, he basically took the income minus the vacancy, minus the bad debt, and said that's the NOI. That's the net operating income. He forgot the expense line. Uh-huh. So the deal went from being a grand slam to being, you know, maybe we break even. Right. He just, it was a simple mistake, right? And so, like, 
you know, you see it all out there and, you know, anything could be made to look right. The question is, are the facts real? Right. So, so that's why we're sitting here today. And, and I, I want to get into that due diligence, what a deal is, where, where do these deals live? Uh, Yuri, let's get over to you. Who, who are you? Why are you sitting here today? What about this conversation resonates with you? So I'm Yuri Goldfein. I'm an investment manager at a Wall Street firm. And my clients are primarily high net worth individuals that have at least 250000 if not much more, to invest. And my clients, being that they're mostly from the Orthodox Jewish community, everyone has a brother-in-law, a neighbor, a cousin, someone that is involved in real estate. And people are always sending out deals. My clients see a lot of these deals and they want to know, should they invest in them? And they're always being, they're always being pitched something here and there. And some of them work out very nicely. Some of them don't. But the real reason I'm here is, unfortunately, a lot of people who have far less money than that mm. take whatever they have and they put it into a deal. So it's been a passion of mine to address this and to educate investors on what they're investing in, what the risks of each offering are, and to help people to really take a step back and, and see, is this the right thing? Is this appropriate? Okay. So, so now that we have a, a basic framework of who everyone is, let's talk real estate. You're in... One second. Okay, go ahead. Real estate, what does real estate mean? All right? I think that's the first thing, you know, you can talk real estate all today. Real estate means so many different things to so many different people. And you have to like first understand what real estate means to you and what you're talking about before you can even discuss anything. Are you talking about buying a single family house? Are you talking about investing in some multifamily property out in Georgia? Or are you talking about, you know, buying a building for yourself, for your, for your business? That's, I think, like, the first thing that people have to understand is just that real estate is so encompassing. There's so many different things that go into real estate. But let's, you know, let's maybe take it down a step and say, okay, let's talk about either real estate investing or real estate deals or something like that. Because otherwise, where do you start? Right. So I think we're going to focus on commercial real estate. Joseph can tell us the different subsets of commercial real estate. Yeah, I mean, commercial real estate goes anywhere from an office building to a hotel to even, you know, some people look at, let's say, an assisted living facility or even a nursing home. If I'm going to own just the building, it's also a piece of real estate. Mm. Almost every business has a component of real estate as well, right? Whether I'm renting or I'm owning, everything that we all do on a daily basis, we all sleep somewhere at night. Everything is real estate. Mm -hmm. So commercial real estate, we we would say, is more something that where someone is paying for something. Not so the fact, paying that a mortgage, own, the fact not that, that I own mortgage. a home, that's my question. The fact that no, I own a home, I am I a real estate professional? No. no. Anything past that, though, is. Like, okay. So if let's say you decide I want to go buy the house next door to me, okay. which for a lot of them, you know, of the smaller or mid-sized investors, it probably makes a lot more sense. Now, you're, now you really are a commercial real estate person. I would have loved to. The, the house next door to me was for sale, but I just didn't have the liquidity, the money, the cash to make that purchase. So let's say someone's listening, right? They're interested in commercial real estate, but they don't have the liquidity. Does that mean it's over for them? They're, they're never going to be a real estate professional? No, because if you look at, you know, even some of our clients or a lot of people who are in commercial real estate, they don't have any liquidity. They're going out and raising that liquidity. So you have to have a source of liquidity to get into commercial real estate. It could be your own, or you can become a syndicator where you're going and raising that liquidity. And that's, you know, I think some of the things that Yudi wants to talk about is what makes a syndicator tick and what is a syndicator and all those things. But what you have to realize is that the person that you're seeing sitting next to you that has all this real estate, a lot of times it's not his money uh-huh. and it's someone else's money. So commercial real estate is anything where you're taking not your own house and you're going and doing something with what, your own money or with someone else's money. That is commercial real estate. Can I borrow money? So we're going to get to all of that, but... Just to lay the groundwork yeah. over here, like Joseph mentioned, a few of those different asset classes, such as office, retail, okay. self-storage, multifamily is by and large the most common one that we see people raising capital from other, from other investors That's for. That's a building. Meaning any- Today, yeah. today in today's environment, well, in the last, let's, the last cycle, because real mm-hmm. estate is very cyclical. I think I wrote in my LinkedIn post yesterday that real estate's all about timing. You can mm-hmm. do everything right, and if you're at the wrong timing, you don't do good, you can do everything wrong, and if you're at the right timing, you're great. But in the last cycle, especially in you know, our circles, it was, for example, it was mostly um, multifamily, whether it's apartment buildings, garden-style apartment buildings, you know, apartment complexes and things like that. Previous cycles, 
let's say pre-08, were more commercial development, things like that. So like office buildings, multifamily development, where they're selling the houses, condos. In the last, I would say, post-2008, the majority of at least money from the circles that we're involved in, you know, has been f- more for multifamily properties. And as people in America have shifted away from owning their houses and more people and more people are renting, more and more liquidity has entered into that market versus previous cycles of real estate. Well, I would add on to that, that really over the last 15 years, we've seen a lot of institutional capital that was previously allocated towards bonds. We've seen them come into real estate because they were looking for yield. And especially mm. well, also- once COVID hit and you know the Fed dropped rates and they couldn't get yield anywhere else, a lot of that capital flowed into real estate and really drove pricing up. In 2017, they changed, they allowed that, you know, let's say I'm a hedge fund or Mm -hmm. I'm a college endowment. So you have to diversify your holdings. You can't be all in one holding. They allowed real estate, especially multifamily, to be considered one of the asset classes that you can diversify into. So it definitely has been, even if you look at it on a, you know, like sort of a Gantt chart type of thing, if you were to see how much the value of multifamily was in 2008 versus what the value of multifamily was, let's just say 12 months ago, I mean, the, the numbers are astronomical. So there's been a lot of cap rate, you know, compression. Well, there's, Joseph, can you, tell, can you explain cap rates to yeah, the audience? So, to me, not the audience. So I'll, I'll do it the simplest way I've ever been explained to me. Okay. And even that's hard. But let's just say like this. If I have $100 million, all right, how much money do I want to earn? on my $100 million a year, all right? So while it doesn't really work that way, but let's just use an example. I, have, I put in $100 million into a deal. I buy a deal for $100 million. That's some of it's my money, some of it's the bank money, but the overall deal is $100 million. I want to earn a five cap on my money. That means that before the increase in rents, before the increase in expenses, and you know, so how do we get to my, what my NOI is, net operating income? I have all my expenses, all my income, sorry, so let's say I have rent, I have other, you know, they charge you for your utilities or they charge you late fees, all that. So I have all my income. So let's just say for argument's sakes, I take in on that $100 million deal, I take in every year $10 million of money, all right? Now I go and I take a um, expenses, I have 50% expense ratio, which is usually lower, but let's just say that I have $5 million, all right? So now I'm earning a five cap day one on that money. It's not really 5%, but it is. Okay. But what happens is with cap rates is that's what you sell for. I have an easy way to explain cap rates. Okay, I think go ahead. If you were to buy this building completely in cash today, that's what your return would be. So Correct. for example, if there's a building that's being sold for $100 million and it's earning $5 million of NOI, let's call that profit. That's awesome. So $5 million of profit per year, and you're going to pay $100 million for that you would be netting a 5% return on right? your money. But on it's, not, money. it's not a true return 5% because mm-hmm. every year your rents either go up or go down. But starting, but starting, the starting point is 5%. Starting day one. I now, mean, you could take that money theoretically and put it into something much safer that will yield 5%. So yes. cap rate's important, right? So cap, well, let's just say this. When, you, when the Fed was at, let's say, a quarter of a point. Okay. Right? So if I, was, you know, if I had my money in a money market account, I was getting what? At most, half a percent a year. Right, this is going back to let's right. just say 2021. Yeah, yeah. Now I can buy a building for 100 million dollars, put in 30, right? Because I get 70 percent loan, or put in 25. Right? On that 25, put in what 25 million dollars to buy it. So I get 25 okay. million dollars cash down. Okay, the rest comes from the bank. Since I bought it at a five cap, I made five million dollars on my 25. Why? Because I had 75 million. Now it's really less because I took the five million dollars at the payment mortgage. Okay. Right. But that's the way you look at it, is how much cash came in and what am, I, what am I taking out from it? So, you know, I can do some simple math. If you had a mortgage at, at 2% or 25 or 3%, you took a mortgage at 3%, interest only, you'd be paying on that $75 million, 3%, uh, help me out here, so I want to... Joseph, I think, I think we lost everyone. With yeah, let's, let's, let's do the math out of so, it. But so, you'd be making, let's say, on your 25 million, you're making $2 million a year. So you're making now you know, uh, eight, nine percent in your money. Uh-huh. But the, the main thing about cap rates are is when I sell a building, I sell it based on a cap rate. And the cap rates are the way investors are using to understand risk, return, and that's what it's really being used for. And this is so critical, meaning if someone says, I want to buy this building and, and, and give it to my kids and their grandkids and hold on to it, 
is that even part of their thinking or no everything comes down to well LA, what's it's the return not really, I can it's not get. really about you it's really about the market and well, in every in every market investors are all bidding on properties and you'll see for example a a very hot market like Austin you might see class A properties trading at very low cap rates which means very high valuations uh -huh. Whereas you'd go somewhere that might be a little riskier or somewhere where population is going down and investors there will say, hold up, this is a little riskier over here. We're not so confident that the building is going to be so valuable in the future. The income might go down a bit. We're only going to pay hey, a seven right. cap for it, so, which means a lower valuation. The lower the cap rate, the higher the valuation. The higher the cap rate, lower. the lower the valuation. It's a very confusing topic. Well, let's take let's take simple numbers, right? So if I had $5 million of income, after yeah. all my expenses a year. Okay. If I get a five cap, my building's worth $100 million. If I get a seven cap, my building's worth $71.5 million. All right? So when I buy the building, if I'm buying, you know, just for argument's sakes, I want to go buy a building in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Or let's just take a bad area of, you know, Cleveland. Something like that. Cleveland people aren't going to come after you, by but, the way. But, you know, okay. But those buildings trade at seven cap. Okay. So the same $5 million of income, I'm paying much less for. Why? Because what we're saying is your risk is so much higher. Mm. Cap rates and the way we evaluate buildings has changed is sort of like a new phenomenon and actually has created a lot of issues in the last cycle, especially considering that when you just take, for example, something called CapEx, mm -hmm. capital expenses. So if let's say I decide I need a new rule for my building, mm -hmm. that doesn't go into my calculation of net operating income. It comes something called below the line. Now what happens is that means I didn't really make that money in the year, but for valuation purposes, we look at it as you made more money. Now if I trade the building, we say that was a one-time expense. But next year, your expenses will be based on without that number. So we're going to trade you for this, this, this number. And what people didn't realize is that when you buy something that's from the 1960s, you're constantly replacing things. Mm. So while, yes, legally, it goes below the line, it doesn't go into your net operating income thing, actual cash in your pocket, it does affect you. Okay, so we've, we've discussed commercial real estate, cap rates, and CapEx. Yuri, well, uh, let, bring us back. Well, let's just wrap that up. Yeah. Commercial real estate, really, the, one of the biggest differences in, between commercial and residential, uh -huh. residential, you're buying yourself a house to live in. Commercial real estate, any of these asset classes you're going to buy, what you're really buying is future income. So if we're expecting that future income to grow, either because rents are going up mm -hmm. or you can cut expenses, then people will be willing to pay a high multiple to what its current earnings are right now mm -hmm. because they're expecting those earnings to go up. And conversely, if you have something that is earning a lot of money now, but you're worried that next year might earn less, then the investors are going to pay a little bit less for that, which means a higher cap rate because they're concerned that those the cash flows are not going to be there next year. Something, let's say, like a rent, a rent stabilized building in New York City, even if it earned $10 million this year, you know in a few years from now, it might be earning a little let's, bit less than that. Let's use a better example, right? Offices, right? An office always trades at a higher cap rate than a apartment building, mm -hmm. right? Give it something even more simpler. Until, let's just say last year or two years ago, a Walgreens, a Wawa, a 7-Eleven, these are stores that people thought would never go anywhere, right? Those would trade at very low cap rates, why? Because I know that Walgreens it opens there. They do so much research. I think it's going to be there for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. right? So if I think that Walgreens is going to be there for the next 40 years, and I know I'm just getting a check because they're paying for all the expenses. They just send me a check every month. It's pretty much a guaranteed investment. I don't need to make so much money on my money. Mm -hmm. If I have to go deal with a, an office building where tenants can move out, I got to go renovate, got to constantly find new tenants, office buildings always traded at a higher cap rate because they had more risk associated with it. So cap rates are supposed to equal risk reward. I think we lost a lot of that in 2021, 2020, 2021, where people said, okay, Florida is just going to go crazy. Yes, Florida has gone crazy, but also there's so much supply that is being added there. Boston's another one of those markets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I saw that we're at a 40-year record high in supply that's going to be coming on mm -hmm. in multifamily. So obviously some markets will do well, some markets won't. And there's really no real estate market. Every single city, every single sub-market, even this side of the street versus that side of the street, it can be totally different. So you can never paint everything with one brush and say everyone's in trouble or everyone's going up, everyone's going down. It, it's, real estate is, is highly local. As everyone says, location, location, location. I once so. explained this to a nursing home operator, mm -hmm. a very successful nursing home operator, came to me and goes to me, Joseph, I'm thinking about buying a medical office building here, right? What do you think about this building? 
And I was trying to explain to him that it's on the wrong side of the tracks. Because he, he goes to me, what do you mean? It's not explained to him like this. If I have a five star nursing home, right? No one really cares what neighborhood I'm in. Right? He was a nursing home guy. He couldn't understand where I was coming from. Because if you're five stars and you have a nice brand of facility and you're doing good work, can you fill your building? Whether it's, it's, it's next to a bad area? Mm-hmm. He goes, yeah. As long as I have my stars, I'm, I have good staff, I can fill it. I him, but if I have to fill an office building, People have to come to my location on a daily basis to go to the doctor. Are they going to want to come to an area where they have to worry about getting the car stolen? Like, no. Are they going to go two blocks over, which is on the other side of the tracks, and, bu- and rent over there because they don't have to worry about getting their car stolen? Right? So real estate is really, I mean, we try to explain this to clients all the time when they come to us, which is something else we should discuss, called comps. Comparisons, right? So if, let's just say we're sitting here in an office above a retail location, and does this compare to a class A brand new office building that was, that's being built? No. Right? You're going to pay a lower rent here. And, but imagine if I bought this building, I said, you know, the guy down the block just built a brand new building. He's getting $40 a square foot. I want $40 a square foot for this space that we're sitting in now. It's, not, it's apples and oranges. Right? So you have to really know what you're looking at, where you are. And that's what's probably where a lot of people go wrong. It's- and, and it's not so hard for an investor if he looks at a deal... And they say we're buying this property here and we're getting fourteen hundred a month in rent for a two bedroom. And they show you on the on the pitch deck, which is called an OM offering memorandum, they'll show you some other comps that are it's not so hard for you to go onto apartments.com, go online, maybe even give them a call, those other properties and see what they're see what they're getting. And you might see that some of these comps that are that they say are getting a higher rent, they might be built they might have been built last year and your property is built 40 years ago. They might be offering a, you know, a gym or a pool and yours isn't. So you have to make sure you're comparing apples to apples and that it's nearby. So many of you have donated to Kolel Chabad. They're helping Israel's poorest people get by with food and other ways to support them. Please help support Kolel Chabad. They're nonprofit. They've been at this for over 225 years. They started in 1788. And regardless of age, ethnicity, religious observance, this organization is helping combat hunger daily. And they're doing it in partnership with the Israeli government and with the help from people like you. They have an army of volunteers. It helps helps keep the cost down. Um, I think they're helping now over 100,000 isolated seniors. And they need our help. So visit kolelchabad.org slash kosher money. The link is in the show notes and help this wonderful charity support the neediest of Israel. Donate today. You can even make a recurring donation, a dollar, five dollars a week, dollar a day, whatever it is that you can give. It really helps out. We can't thank you enough. And now back to this week's episode. So I just want to establish a clear difference between two types of deals. One is you could be doing the due diligence either yourself or through a company like yours. Or you could be approached, and I want to talk about this scenario where many people are, they're, they're at their local 7-Eleven, they're in their, their school coffee room, and someone approaches them and says, hey, this deal's a banger. You, you know, all I need is $50,000. You have that from your wedding money, $100,000. It, it's a no-brainer. I've done deals like this all the time. What, what are the numbers and w- w- what are the metrics? Is, are, are they teaching them in that room about cap and capex and all that or it's just hey here's a number joseph and give me the money and i'll take care of the rest and maybe it sometimes works out we see that all the time where someone will approach someone yeah to try to raise money from them sometimes it's the actual guy who's buying the building sometimes it could be someone else who's trying to raise money for that deal sometimes it could be a previous investor of the syndicator who's who's doing the deal and everything could be 100 percent true and above board well they'll say I invested in his last deal. He he everything he said was true. I got a monthly check. I put in a hundred. I got back a hundred fifty thousand two years later. This guy knows what he's doing. He's doing another deal. Ellie, you should come on and you should you should put your wedding money into this too. I'm telling you, it's it's great. Happens and, all and, the time, right? This happens day and this night. Is, this wherever is, you go. You know, in, in our circles, you see that you see this everywhere. And everything that this guy claimed may have been true, but you have to understand that that's in hindsight. We're looking what happened in the last two years where real estate, especially multifamily real estate, appreciated significantly. And, you know, we saw a ton of rent growth. We saw cap rates come down, which means values go up. 
So that's why the guy did so well. It doesn't necessarily mean that he was a good operator, just the market for real estate went up. So a rising tide lifts all boats, and this deal did very nicely. But, you, but now that you're looking at a new deal right now, you could never assume that that past performance is going to translate into, into future success, that's, which is you know, where the, Joseph the, comes in. That's you know, the, always the advertising, you know, past performance. But I'll take even like a step back for a second, right? Mm -hmm. we, we see this all day. You could be the most successful real estate person out there. But just take, you know, use just a fine example of this, right? Related. You know, it was probably the most successful developer in the history of development in, in the United States of America. I think that's a pretty fair assessment. You know, he started his company back in 72, focused originally on affordable housing. They've had deals that have lost money. There's no such a thing of people every deal making money. If there would be, then the returns would be like the Fed used to give at a quarter point. Mm -hmm. Because there'd be no risk. That's item number one. Item number two is you have to also understand the person who's coming to pitch you, right? As, and I know we, I'm trying to find the right word for this, and maybe you'll have to translate it. It's called Nagias. Yuri, what would you say? Well, we, yes. Bias, maybe, Bias, but or... it's, not, it's more than that. It's not, bias is he, not He has enough. an interest. He's, it's, he, it's very he, much he... an interest. So let's, let's look at it this way, right? Mm -hmm. the, the guy who's coming to is either one or two things. Item number one is he's the actual syndicator himself. That means he's putting the, put, deal, the deal together. together he right? knows the building. He, he's the one who's going and raising the money. Okay. So he needs to raise money. And at that point, he already might be hard on his deposit. It might not have a way out of the deal. And whether it's a good deal or not, he's committed. So it might not be a great deal for you, but for him, he doesn't have a choice. He needs to raise that money. Yeah. Otherwise, he's going to lose his deposit and all his time and all his why, effort. Why did this guy do that if he wasn't certain he's going to raise the money? So I'll even give you an example. Like one of the best syndicators that we work with, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit like annoyed right now. He went into a deal, let's just say last year, January, went mm -hmm. hard. Obviously, between January and April when the closing happened, Interest rate changed, started to change. He didn't want to walk away from his deposit at 1031, so I had to go ahead with the deal and didn't get as good as rate as he wanted on his loan. Mm -hmm. It's hurting the returns now. Now he came back to me, okay, Joseph, I know I messed up here a little bit. Can you figure out how to, how to fix the situation here? Obviously, I can't fix the rate, but what can we do about operations and things like that? So that's, you know, that's a classical situation where you can have even the best guy out there. Who, and I would say this, this guy's from the top 5% of syndicators and you know you get caught in that thing where you now you're stuck and you know it's very hard to take a step back and say i'm not doing this deal that's item number one other thing is and this is where it's even more dangerous is okay we have a syndicator you know mr um, smith mm -hmm. he needs to raise 10 million dollars he's not going to go around and, and raise 10 million dollars he's going to go get three guys to go raise the money for him now he's going over to his friends say, I got to go raise $10 million. And the guy goes, you know, I'll raise $3 million for you. And you'll pay me for that, you know, 1%, 2% as a fee for raising the money. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, so now a guy comes over to you in the coffee room, or a guy comes over to you, he met you in the supermarket, he's like, I have a great deal for you. You want to put money in? And the guy's like, is it a real good deal? He's like, yeah, I'm putting money myself. Isn't that? A, he might not be putting money himself. B, the money himself he might be putting is the money that he's getting for raising the money. And once you take on that role, you lose all sense of being honest. You know, one of the things that my clients love the most about me, I'm very blunt, if you haven't realized it yet. And I will say it like it is, I don't really care. You want to fire us, fire us. You know, anyone who's read any of my LinkedIn posts knows I'm not sugarcoating it. I'm going to tell you like it is. And there have been times that we've had deals, you know, where clients came to us with due diligence or from memorandums, underwriting, and we like the deal. And I'll pass along to some of my other clients. But I, have never, I don't take money for that. I won't take a fee for telling one of my other clients to put money in there. Mm -hmm. right? Why? If I think it's a good deal, right, and I think that you know, my clients, might, you know, some of my investor clients might be interested, tell them, here's an opportunity, go speak to the guy. Here's, you know, here's our reports of what we found on site and what we feel. And if you want to put money in there, great. Right? But I'm not telling you to put money in there because I'm going to make something. I'm telling you because you're a nice guy. You, know, you like me, I like you. Here's an opportunity. But I, I, you know, if once I start taking fees for that, then I'm all about my fees, right? And to the point, to the other side of it is, like, we've had clients that came to us to do the diligence, to do an underwriting, and we've taken our name off the product. Right? Normally we say, you know, Visionary, you know, did the work, we have a logo on it. And I, and I tell my staff, like, pull the, our logo off it. I don't want to be associated with this. So this guy, you know, he decided that even though his rate cap is at six and a quarter, he's going to say his rate cap is at five and a quarter. Like, get me out of here.
a rate lock is where you, if you took a loan at say a year ago at let's say two percent, that was the that was the SOFA, which we won't even try to explain, but that was the overnight rate for thing. As that goes up every month, and you know the Fed's now at five, your your rate and your loan goes as well. So you buy a, you go to Wall Street, go to Goldman Sachs, go to different places. You can buy a lock that your rate won't go over a certain amount. I think that's similar to a residential mortgage, right? No, you residential buy, mortgage. Or at least I've heard of a rate lock there. No, right? there it's a different thing. Rate uh, lock over there is that, let's say I want to buy a house and it's going to take me 60 days to close. Mm-hmm. I can lock my rate today right. for the next 60 days. So here is I can lock my rate for the next three, five years. Uh-huh. That's what it is. So if, say if the rate goes up, this other company, let's just think about it this way. If I'm a bank and I lent you money at, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, if I was a bank, I lent you money at 3%. Uh-huh. How can I lend you money at 3% to get a coupon at 3% if I'm right now paying my deposit as 5%? Right. So their rate goes up following what Understood. the Fed rate is. So, so what's happening in this coffee room in the supermarket? Is this good intention, family slash friends? There's like a certain familiarity component that is creating this scenario where, oh, I don't have to do due diligence. We married cousins, you know, like... That's uh, sadly but true. It's a real problem. I know Yuri can speak about this more, but like we even had a deal where, you know, a brother came to us. You know, my brother asked me to put money in this deal. Uh-huh. What do you think? I want to ask my worst enemy to put money in this deal. It was that bad. Wow. Uh, we're in a city that has rent control, and they're showing raising the rents fifteen percent. That's not legal. Okay? We're you know there was no increase in taxes for year two. They weren't calculating increase in taxes. Everyone knows you buy a piece of real estate, taxes go up. But most well, well, let's jump back a second to just take a look at some of the differences between commercial real estate and residential. Most of the listeners are probably familiar with buying a house and the residential real estate, but commercial, as we said, you're really buying the income. So if, the ta- if taxes go up on a single family house, they go up 20%, you could probably still sell the house for the same price. Mm-hmm. If your insurance goes up 20%, your house is still worth the same. However, when you are looking at commercial real estate, you're not really buying the building, you're buying income. So when you're looking at last year's NOI, it was a million dollars, but now we know that insurance in some, cl- in some places is going crazy. It could be 100%, maybe even more than that. You go increases or tax reassessments, every, every single city will do those differently, but those are also very common. Or even your payroll is going up with inflation. We see expenses are rising, so that affects your income, which affects your value. Yeah, 100%. So... I mean, there are places right now in America where apartment owners are paying more for insurance than they're paying for taxes. Mm. That has never happened before. So it's, it's, you know, we're in a little bit of a wild west right now with insurance, but like we've seen deals where, where right now we have a team in my office that's basically doing like asset management, helping people who are already in deals figure out what to do. And we've seen deals where like we asked like, why didn't you calculate for this expense? Right? And their expenses are much higher than they calculated. And they're like, oh, we didn't think about this. We didn't think about that. We didn't realize about this. We thought we could do it for this. If they didn't really get into the guts of things, right, they decided, okay, we're going to come in and uh, you know, I'll just give you an easy example. We're going to start charging for parking. Mm-hmm. So a lot of apartment complexes, especially ones with like indoor garages, they want to charge for parking. Well, guess what? This town has an ordinance that you're not allowed to charge for parking. Mm-hmm. Right? They didn't know that. They bought the building. They started charging for parking. Someone went to town hall and said, my owner is charging me for parking. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry, that's not legal. Now, all of a sudden, they don't have that income. Mm-hmm. So all their increase in value is there. Or, you know, like we were talking about, like, comps before, or things like that. Just because someone's overpaying for something in a certain market, let's just say for argument's sake, you know, I see a property that's sold, you know, for a shopping center. Mm-hmm. And it's sold for $50 million, right? So I think, okay, a very similar shopping center down the block should also sell $50 million. No. Right? The reason why that shopping center sold for $50 million and this one's not is this one has a new bank coming to it and the owner was able to know that I can pay a little bit more for it because I know I'm bringing in a bank right after closing. I've made a deal with the bank before I bought the property. Mm. That doesn't mean the property next door has the same value. Or you have, let's just say, even like an apartment complex is, I know that this owner just did, redid all the roofs. So I can pay a little bit of a higher price. I know I won't have that expenses. So just because someone else did something, or I own just, we had a client right before Yantov, you know, he was buying a 160 units. He told me, you know, officially for the market, I'm overpaying. But I'm really not. Why? He owns the property literally next door. He has over there 240 units. 
if he puts the two of them together, which they originally once were, both by the same developer, now he can, how much savings can he have on this property? How much staff can he reduce? How much better contract can he get on his garbage pickup? All these things. He doesn't have to have two sets of managers. He only has one manager. So he can pay a little bit more than the next guy on the street. But Joseph, how is an investor who has 50000 or $100,000 that he's looking to invest, he sees one of these deals, how's he supposed to know about that new roof or about that bank? What's someone like that supposed to do? That is a real problem. You know, it's not really for this. Maybe you should do a separate episode about accredited investing. There are officially rules when you go out to raise money, how you're supposed to raise money, who can put money into deals. It's not for me to say, because I never really, I know about the rules and understand how it works, but it's not really what I do for a living. You can maybe bring in like a securities lawyer who can explain it. But the same way, you can't just go out and like raise money for a stock Mm -hmm. that's going public. It has to be done through a major Wall Street firm for reasons. Officially, unless it's someone that you know or the way you're doing it, you can't just go out and raise money from a person who's not really capable of doing it. So, yes, you know, you have people like Garen Condone who like go through this whole day and they have all these disclaimers and all those things. You know, I've never sat down and reviewed his material and his numbers. I can't, I have no comment about it. It does seem at the eye lump, you know, a little bit like what he called, but, you know, based on what he gives you, it's very, very hard to tell. Mm-hmm. But you, at least there, they're officially following some SEC rules. When you're, you know, going to person A, person B, person C, or even worse, when you have someone else doing that, who's really not involved in the deal, and just doing it as a way to make a few extra dollars for himself, yes, you can end up with a lot of situations where you're in this boat. So all things being equal, if someone did want to get into real estate and had the money, sounds like it's wiser for that person to look for his own property and do his own due diligence or use a team to do the due diligence. But let's say, again, but let's say you have your own job, you're a doctor, or you, you have your own business. You want to do this passively. If we're, you don't necessarily want a second job of being a landlord and, and dealing with all that. Yep, so, uh, but, you know, let's, let's take a step back. That's actually a good point. If you're a doctor, right, you went to medical school, you have a certain level of sophistication, I, don't, I feel more comfortable doing it. It's more that person who's 24 years old, has $50,000 of wedding money. Mm-hmm. That's really the problem. You're looking for a return, right? And, not, and this is a real estate episode, but I think we should spend a couple of minutes. There are other ways to possibly get an equal or greater return that's even less risky than just giving your $50,000 to your cousin because he says he has a building in Alabama. Oh, absolutely. And this is something that I think is really unique to our community. Because if you go elsewhere and you see high net worth individuals and you take a look at their investment portfolios, if they invest in private placements, private offerings, it's going to be a very small component of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas you look around our community and investing equals someone else's real estate deal. People think, oh, I invest. That means I invest in a real estate deal. And I see clients all the time that they come to me, they don't have a dime in the stock market or in any typical investment. What does investing mean to them? Real estate deals. And all these real estate deals, when you think about them, number one, you have no control of when you're getting your capital back. It's completely in the syndicator's hands, which you might be okay with. But for some people, the liquidity could be important. And we didn't even get to the risks of leverage where I've yet to see someone do a deal where he's paying all cash for it. He's all, every deal I've seen has is leverage. with leverage. Now, well, let's, let's, we're you know, going to explain what leverage is in a second. But I want to take a step back then. Let's, let's look at it this way, right? I'm just thinking about a certain family member of mine. Okay. Right? Has a great job, has constantly has income out there. So between, you know, and they look constantly looking to put in $50,000 into deals. Now, this person is semi-sophisticated, has a degree, and understand basic level risk. And at the end of the day, the real estate does give them between the depreciations, the tax incentives, and things like that. If I have, let's just say, $300,000, right, and I want to put $50,000 into a deal, going to the stock market, to most people, it's not something they can actually understand. And I think that part of the problem is that it's not tangible. So what, I bought $50,000 of Tesla shares? What do I own, right? Like some kids around me, I drive a Tesla. You know, he said to me at one point, you'd be better off buying the stock than buying the car. I bought the Model 3 back in, uh, you know, 2019. Uh-huh. But uh, let's say, you know, if you're a typical, you know, and you can take the risk of losing that $50,000, but you want to have the opportunity to make, you know, a, a decent return, as long as you've done 
some of your own research. You can say a guy gives you a, a, bo- a book, you know, all the information there, and he says, okay, rents are, here's the rent, projected rents. Mm-hmm. And you, you don't use his projected rents. It's not very hard to go to apartments.com, type in a zip code. and it's see accurate. what. Yeah, that's what they're advertising apartments for, mm-hmm. right? And if they're advertising apartments in Tucson, Arizona, in this area of Tucson, Arizona, and while I might not get 100% comps, but if the guy says in, in the OM that I'm looking to get, let's just say, $1,300 a month, then I'm seeing that it's $1,300, $1,400, $1,500 for all the buildings around it. Mm-hmm. That means the guy is being conservative. If mm-hmm. I'm seeing that he's saying that it's $1,300 and everything else is at $1,000, $1,100, run away. Yeah, if it's only $50,000 you have, doesn't make any sense. If you're a person that has three, four hundred thousand dollars and you want to put fifty thousand dollars here, fifty thousand dollars there, between your tax incentives and between appreciations and the returns, it makes sense to have that as part of your portfolio. The reason why a lot of people outside, let's just take, you know, that doctor out in Alabama doesn't have that real estate is he just doesn't have that networking opportunity. So yes, we do have those networking opportunities, but like with any other business in life, right? There always will be those people who take that opportunity and they take advantage of it. Whether they mean to, whether they don't mean to, whether they don't even realize what they're doing and they just get so caught up in it, they will take advantage of the opportunities. You have to, just because the guy is throwing around money, right? And everyone thinks, you know, I'm just thinking about one person that we did some work for. Mm -hmm. The guy spends money like, you know, nauseously, Mm -hmm. right? And we went and did some work for him and we realized the guy's losing money. So, you know, it doesn't mean that just because the guy is throwing the biggest parties and all those things, he's actually making it. A lot of times, you know, I think now it's becoming a thing where even Silicon Valley, they're saying, you know, fake it to make it until you make it is over with. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of that that people see. They see, oh, this guy's throwing around money. He might be doing that just so people throw more money at him. Mm-hmm. And that's a real risk. Mm-hmm. But just because you see that that guy is being successful or quote unquote successful, doesn't really mean that he is. That's why, like, if I'm going to recommend somebody to somebody, I have to actually, you know, it's always a question. I look at the numbers, I look at the person. Mm -hmm. Some people only look at the person. I think that's a problem. Some people only look at the numbers. I also think it's a problem. You have to take a look where I start at the numbers and also look at the person. Is this the type of person that I feel like is just in it for the fees? You know, because there are a lot of fees. There's syndication fee. There's asset management fees. There's management fees sometimes. There are a lot of fees that the person who's putting together a deal is making throughout. Like in anything in the world, we have some very good people. You have some very bad people. You have some people in between. And you have to make sure that the person you're dealing with is really honest. Then you have to make sure that, you know what? He doesn't have blinders on and the numbers make sense also. A short recess from this week's episode. We're here with Shmuel Shaiwitz. Shmuel, I have a question for you. Approved funding. How does the company make money? How do you pay your bills? How does it all work in the mortgage industry? Oh, wow. Getting right to it. All right. So it's a great question. A lot of people have the same question and confusion because they don't know how banks work, how brokers work, how lenders work. So happy to answer the question. It's basically when you get financing for anything, the bank will either make their money up front or over the life of the loan. So if you walk into ABC Bank and you get an interest rate of 5%, then the bank knows that they will be getting 5% on that for the rest of the mortgage for 30 years. With a broker or with a lender, it's different. With a broker, they're the matchmaker. Broker is basically being that intermediary. They take your information, they place your loan application, whether it's a car loan, a student loan, a mortgage loan, they're placing that with the bank. And for that, they're getting a fee from you or from the bank for bringing them that business. Often enough, that's comparable to what the bank is offering, or sometimes there's some kind of an incentive. Lenders, I believe, and, and certainly I'm biased, lenders are in the- You're a lender? I'm a lender. Okay. I'm a direct lender. So we're in the, what I consider to be the golden middle, which is we act like a bank. We are a bank. You're asking me earlier how we get paid. We get paid. We're actually giving the money out to people. But how we get paid is we close that loan. We give them the money. 30, 45, 60 days, 90 days later, we will take a bunch of mortgages and we will transfer them over to banks or servicing companies, and then they will pay us a premium for that. So for the consumer, it's all smooth. They just transitioned into a new lender who's going to, you know, build them every single month. And for the bank, you make your money by selling these mortgages. The key is working with a broker, a bank, a representative who will best capitalize on the parameters of your circumstances because 
I believe everybody should be rewarded if they have something of benefit, a mm -hmm. compensating factor. If somebody has phenomenal credit, they should see if they can do better. If somebody's putting down a significant down payment, can they do better? Walking into your local bank, everybody's in the same box. Working with the lender, they're able to find the nuance to say, and we run every single loan that we do through our system. We have 3,500 programs that we're constantly evaluating every single day to find out what the best program is for each client that we work with. Wow, you did that quickly and efficiently. I feel like I got a, a good handle. So I need a mortgage, I come to you, you find the best rate, the best situation you can, given my situation, and then we close. I pay my first payment to approved funding. 45, 60 days later, you might sell that mortgage to another bank that will pay you money for that mortgage, and then you rinse and repeat and do this all Correct. over again. And I will say, just because you're currently paying your mortgage to ABC Bank does not mean that they're the best people to be calling to get new financing uh, because these things right. constantly change and you want to have somebody, a broker, a lender who's on the forefront to know which programs and rates are best given your circumstances today. Very interesting. If you want to get in touch with Shmuel, you have a question about your mortgage refinancing or even starting fresh, approvedfunding.com slash kosher money. You owe it to yourself to reach out to Shmuel. And now back to this week's episode. Joseph, in his example, he said, Real estate's fifty thousand of his three hundred thousand dollars, meaning diversification, right? Sure, but I but Joseph said something else that made my blood boil a little bit. Go ahead about how people think in our community. It's pretty common. People think the stock market. It's it's a concept that you can't relate to. What are you really buying? What what does it mean? Whereas real estate, on the other hand, it's a real thing. You could hold on to it. You could touch it. You could feel the bricks. And people say it's the safest investment out there. I even saw this quote from FDR. Yeah. That says real estate cannot be lost or stolen, nor can it be carried away. Oh, it can't be per purchased, carried away. Well, we'll get there. Purchase with common sense, paid for in full, and managed with reasonable care. It's about the safest investment in the world. This was FDR. Now, the paid for in full was the first thing that jumped at me because, like we explained, almost every deal we see, if not every deal, is done with leverage, which means that they're borrowing money from the bank to invest which adds a whole new element of risk. But before we even go there, there's a thinking in our community that real estate is, is just so safe. We've seen so many people do phenomenally well with it, that it is the best investment and everything should go into real estate. Whereas the stock market, it's this funny thing. It goes up, it goes down. What really is it? You see the numbers, this, it, it, nobody understands why it moves. People don't realize that if you buy an index fund that's diversified, you own equity in all those companies and you have liquidity that you control. You can decide when to sell it. Nobody else does. If you don't use margin, then you're not borrowing to invest. So the risk profile there is, is apples and oranges compared to participating in a syndication. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I think going back to FDR's thing is that, you know, we see this with a lot of clients and, you know, I was asked my st staff as a joke on one of our internal chat groups today. You know, tell me over like, you know, what are the best syndication stories and one of the worst. So one of the stories that like popped out, one of my staff reminded me of that is about a little over, let's say 14 months ago, a client came to us, a young guy who's making a lot of money in a business. He started buying real estate. And he had a choice, you know, we did the underwriting for him. He hired us through diligence because he's more about a guy who makes is probably, I think on a good month, the guy's, the guy's earning around $200,000 a month cash. Right, so this guy was, you know, and he saw that's where he wants to go to. Which really, for if you're gonna buy and hold it for long term, that's where that type of guy really wants to be. So what he goes does? Okay, so I spoke to my mortgage. We told him, okay, so buy it and take a long term debt, take ten years down on the property, lock in your rate, and great, it's a very stabilized asset. You're buying it at a six cap. You're buying it out, in, you know, in the Midwest. You know, but prior to you know, there's some room to improve the property. There's actually two properties. One. That was very stable, one that needs some work. So do two separate loans. Comes back to, you know, as my mortgage broker said, that every, I'll make more money if I take both of them bridge and then go for one stabilized loan bridge, afterwards. Bridge, you want to explain what bridge is? Bridge is where, well, that literally means a bridge. I, right now, I'm at the point of buying it. Mm -hmm. I need someone to help me get over to the other side to stabilization. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take a loan that's a little bit more risky mm -hmm. because it's a very short-term loan. Mm -hmm. And so it's worthwhile me taking that risk if it's a short-term thing, because I can make some money very, very quickly. So if I just say, for argument's sake, my income is now at $3 million, and two years from now, I get the $5 million, I take a bridge loan, because now I can get out all my cash that I put into it originally. 
So, and we told him, like, it doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. Right? And we had this fight with him back and forth, back and forth, until his father got involved and told him, leverage, yeah, it's a bad thing. Right? Because at the end of the day, if you have a loan from the bank, I got to pay it back one day, right? So if I can take less loan in longer terms, I'm always better off. Uh-huh. Right now, one of the biggest problems in commercial real estate is that you have all these loans. Let's just take an office building loan. Uh-huh. Now, we're involved with a property that the loan, I think, is doing six months from now. There's no real way to refinance it. Right? So if they had a longer term loan because one of the main tenants moved out because of COVID and they're not renewing the lease. Now there's a lot of issues. Had they had a longer term loan or had they not refined last time they bought the building and they didn't have as much debt on it, they'd be in a much better position. So the really successful people, you know, I, I once heard a very, very successful guy early in my career tell me, he goes, I refile all the time. Yeah? I just don't take more money out. All right? So yeah, if I can get a better rate with my terms up or something like that, I'll take, I'll take, let's say, you know, I bought the building originally for $100 million. I paid off 10 of it over the last two years. I'll take a new loan for $90 million. There's no problem with refi. I'm just not taking out more money from the bank. I want to get, as, I want to own as least money to the bank because then you're much more secure. Mm-hmm. All right. End of the day, if I buy a piece of property, right, and let's say the bank gives me 80% or 75% or 60, 70% financing, they come first. Right. They have to get paid off first. So, the more debt you have on a property, the more risky it is for you, know, for you. Which is why in my line of work, the real estate funds that we look at, or if you look at publicly traded REITs, the leverage that they take is usually much lower, let's say 40, maybe 50%. If you're at 60, that's called high in the rest of the world. But when you look at the world of syndications, it used to be 75% was normal, but then the last few years we had this whole bridge debt craze where we've seen, I've seen as high as 85, maybe you've seen higher 93, than that. 93, yeah. uh, some Wh- garbage, which, garbage. Which, what does that really mean? That means if you're buying a property for $100 million, the bank is lending you $93 million, and you're putting in the other seven, let's call it. Let's ignore the closing costs for a second. So if this property goes up 10% to $110 million, you more than doubled your money. However, if this property falls 10%, instead of you losing 10% of what you put in, you're completely wiped out. Mm. So this is where leverage, while a lot of people consider it a plus, the more leverage you can get, the better, take as much as they're willing to offer. Leverage can come back to bite you on the way down. It works, it works great on the way up, but when you're on the way down, it, that's how you get wiped out. I will say this, the, the worst way to invest in real estate is a REIT. I can't tell you how many you know, deals we've had clients buy from REITs or from or some of the you know, larger funds. You walk in there and you're like, what the heck was going on here? And there's a lot of money to be made buying those deals. So mm-hmm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advertise, you know, there are some good REITs out there, but by and large, on the deals that I've seen, you know, clients have hired us for the diligence that are owned by REITs, there's a lot of meat on the bone. We had a deal we walked that was, the capital was raised by a very large Wall Street firm. They basically put together capital to go buy, deal, you know, to go buy deals. Mm-hmm. They bought a deal and they decided they're going to do the value add. Well, they went and painted in all the bathrooms with flat paint, right? They hired a management company, told them to go renovate, they put it on flat paint. We walked, it was like 600 units, 190 of them had mold growing in the bathrooms. They just used the wrong paint. Mm-hmm. A seasoned operator would have walked in there, seen it at the five apartments, stopped it, made sure they put the right paint in there and wouldn't have those issues. So you have like these funds that don't really understand real estate. All they understand is the financing of it and the money of it. So those are not like the place I'd run to, you know? But at the end of the day, there are a lot of good syndicators out there. There are a lot of bad ones also. There's a few of them blowing up right now. You know, we could spend hours talking about those ones that are having problems. And even the best guy won't always have you know, the best deals. And time, it can also affect you. Know, if you bought a building in New York City in 2019, in January, by May, even if you put down, you, know, you have to put down 40% in those buildings, you're underwater. Mm-hmm. Change the rent laws, and you're in trouble. You know, on the other hand, if you bought that same property out in Alabama and you did nothing, you were able to sell it in 2021 for profit. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you have to see the bigger picture of what's going on there. But, you know, to, to go and say that, you know, a person who has $200,000 shouldn't be having $50,000 in real estate, I think is wrong. If a person has $50,000 to their name that they made on their wedding and that's what they're putting into it, they'd be better off going and buying a house out somewhere or something like that, or maybe teaming up with a friend to buy, you know, put money to buy a house and have something real. It, it's just too, otherwise, it's too much, you know, it's too much risk. Now, 
is how commercial real estate differs from residential, especially on the lending side. We all know with a house, you can get a 30 year mortgage mm -hmm. fixed rate, sometimes put down as little as three or 5%. If rates fall, no biggie, you refinance, you get the lower rate, no problem. But commercial, generally the loan terms are gonna be, let's say five years, seven years, maybe 10 years. Getting fixed rate means that if the rates fall, you, you're going to have prepayment penalties. No refinancing? Just, you can't just refinance no. and just you say, pay, get the lower you rate. You have to guarantee basically the amount of interest they're going to earn. You know, if let's um, just say the, the, you have to pay off whatever, the, the, it's called defeasance, or you have to pay back. Yield maintenance. Yield maintenance, you know, and then you got to put the defeasance. There are ways of dealing with it, but you're going to have to, which makes a, a very interesting situation now where you have deals. We have one deal where, you know, the, the rate on the property is 3% with another seven years left. Mm -hmm. You know, the property has a lot of issues, but someone's looking at the deal and says, like, I went out to the bank today, I'll be paying 6%. So if I get 3%, it works the other way as well. That is something that, you know, I, I don't know if you have like international viewers, but if let's say you live in London, they don't have Freddie Mac and, you know, Freddie Mae and these type of things where you can go and government buys mortgages. So you can't get a 30 year loan. You get a five year loan and it resets every five years. So right now, if your loan's coming due on your house in London, right, you're really up a creek because mm. you're 5% interest. Right, versus paying 1%, 2% where it was five years ago is a huge difference in a monthly payment. So we do have, you know, I think what the government has done here and allowing you to get a 25-year mortgage and all that has made, you know, Americans get to where they are in terms of home ownership and things like that. And it's great. But on the commercial side, it doesn't really work that way. So a lot of that is floating debt. And especially when rates went down to zero, COVID, we saw a lot of people taking these, these bridge loans where it's a floating rate. It was at that point, let's say three and a half or 4%. But now that the Fed hiked the overnight rates by about 5%, these mortgages uh, are eight, about nine, are, are eight or nine. Some of them have rate caps, which, mm -hmm. uh, which we explained earlier. earlier. So right now they may only be paying five or six or, but once those rate caps burn off, these properties may be in trouble unless their income doubles. What does it mean participating in a syndication deal as a limited partner? So let's we'll just look at it this way. There's always called general partner and limited partner. So let's just say for our GP and LP is how okay. they're abbreviated. Let's just say like this. If I'm a LP, right, I'm a limited partner. I have limited rights. I'm the one that's putting the money in. I have limited rights. Let's just say for argument's sake, you know, the deal makes a million dollars, right? 70% of that goes to the LPs and 30% goes to the GP. So there's a split and there's different split ratios. And in theory, the LP should be making more money than GP on a deal. The GP is not, you know, he's the general partner, the one who's doing it and taking care of all of it. And so he's earning a percentage for that as well. And he's the one who's take, he's doing the, all the hard work. So for his hard work, he earns what's called a syndication or a promote in, you know, in those things. So mm -hmm. even though he didn't put some money into the deal or maybe put 10% of the money, he gets a percentage for taking care of all these things. Got it. So that's also something we like to see when you're looking at a deal. If you see that the sponsor himself is putting in a significant chunk of the equity, then you can think that your interests are, are going to be somewhat aligned there. But beware that I've seen a lot of sponsors take their, their capital out. Once the deal closes, they'll, they'll find someone else to, to take that. I, I, don't, I don't see that stuff, so I can't tell you. We're not, re we're not really involved in that, type, that end of the deal. I will say this, you know... Investing in real estate is like anything else. It has risks. We've lived in an environment where those risks were minimized for many years. We're now seeing those risks come back and people are getting a little bit of a wake-up call. But on an overall basis, if you're someone who's worth $300,000 and you invest the $50,000 with the right person, you can do very well. But one thing you have to understand is, someone once explained to me that the way he looks at it is, I gave the money to that person, I forget about it, and hopefully it makes me a return. Now, if you're not going to do that, it's very hard to sleep at night. You really have to you know, really trust the person that you're giving to. And just because it's your friend in shul and this and that, or your, you know, your friend that you know since childhood, that's usually where you end up with the most problems. Mm -hmm. Is that you trust them too much, and you're not really looking at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's apples and oranges comparing to investing on your own, say in the stock market or somewhere else. Because there, you have complete control. You have the liquidity. No one else has the keys to your capital. Whereas yep. if you go into a syndication, number one, someone else has the money. So we're, we're going to assume that he's 100% honest and he knows what he's doing. 
but, but you, you also just, lose you, that. The problem with investing in stock market is people have knee jerk reactions. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're like a guy like Warren Buffett and you can invest and you can hold for the long term and the stock market is down 20% today and you don't really care, great. Right. The problem with most normal human beings, and this is why the stock market fluctuates so much, is they either overexerbent when it goes up and they over take out their money when it goes down. And they're not able to live the ups and down and see the long term things, just human nature. Someone called me up, he's looking for his mother, you know, his father passed away, his mother has some money, he wants to put it into certain deals. I asked him once, like, why don't you go put in the stock market or something? I was like, my mother, if the stock market is down 10% that day, is going to go sell the stocks, not just hold on to it. My mother needs an investment that's secure, but also doesn't allow her to, to do knee-jerk reactions. She also needs a financial advice. She does, but <laughs> it, it, what happens is, is that, you know, even when she had a financial advisor, which is right. like, this lady had significant amount of money and she had a financial advisor. Your financial advisor, if you tell him that you want to sell, he can try to talk you out of it. But if right. he's not successful, right. he cannot, yes. talk, he has to legally sell for you. So, you know, it came COVID and his mother decided to liquidate all her holdings. Sure. Right. And, and like, and he's like, had she just held on to it, right. most of that money would have came back. Right. It's not like she liquidated it and two months later went back into the market. She never went back in. So she only had the downside of it. So for a lot of people out there, not being in control, actually can be sometimes an advantage. Now it has right. its disadvantages also. I know there are people now who are, you know, very upset, let's say, at the syndicate for not doing certain things and they're stuck. All right. We deal with this, we see this all day. People come to us, they invest in, meaning they want them to sell the building. Or they want or... to hit, you know, let's say we have a deal that we're working on with someone who invested twenty million dollars in a deal. Mm-hmm. And we need the syndicator to do certain things to try to improve, you know, and he doesn't really have the leverage on him to, you know, he already put the money in. Now he like how do we get the syndicator to actually, you know, Thank God we were able to get him to do what he needs to do and we're now on the right direction. But he didn't really have that leverage. So you really need to have, you know, there has to be a right balance of it where you have the leverage, but you're also not a thing that right now, you know, a lot of deals, let's say, you know, if I bought a deal a year ago, well, commercial real estate is down 20%. If I had to sell today, if I hold it out for the next six years, I'll do very well. Mm-hmm. I just have to hold it out. So you got to be able to, that's one of the advantages that real estate does have over the stock market. If you, I don't need to be liquidated, then, and especially if I'm not in a position that I can get, you know, that I'm going to have a bank call me and say, I got to make a payment tomorrow or pay off my mortgage, I can be in a very good position that I, can, I have time to weather out the storm. So, Joseph, I'd perhaps agree with you if people bought buildings without any debt on them. Even but, with but that. once you add leverage to the mix, you just can't compare the risk profile of going into syndication versus owning a portfolio of index funds. Not, and also remember, you're usually going to buy one building in one city, in one area. That doesn't make versus, sense. Versus that you can't do. You have to diversify. If I'm going to say right now, if I only have $50,000 and I'm putting it all in one deal, uh, that's the worst thing you can do, right? If, same way, if you, I came to you and I said, I have $200,000, I want to put it in the stock market. I'm, the, I'm going to diversify between 10 index funds, right? You have to also diversify your real estate holdings between different syndicators, different operators, different classes. One of the things that you know, bothers me the most is you know, we asset manage hotels. Or we asset manage multifamily as well. We asset manage industrial properties. Some clients say to me, I only understand, I can't understand how a hotel works. I don't want to be involved in it. Yes, hotels, some of them got really hurt in COVID, but a lot of them have made, we have one hotel we asked to manage that had a 21% you know, return last year to investors, cash on cash. Mm-hmm. This year, it's going to do it most probably much better than that. Right? You can't get that you know, in a down market on, in, in, you know, in the stock market. Is that It's going to return a very nice return. I don't touch hotels. I don't understand it. So if you're going to say that I only buy apartment buildings in New York City and I'm not going to diversify from it, if that's what you're doing as a business model, great. All right? If you're doing it as an investor, not so great. Because you have to be able to diversify your holdings so this way you're not, you know, rent control comes into play, changes the rules, now I'm stuck. Not too different than when someone buys stocks, they buy Correct. national and international. Yeah, but 100%, especially diversifying within syndicators. Like you mentioned, unfortunately, we've seen some stories where one syndicator moves money from one entity to another and the whole ship goes down. So if you're putting money into syndications, diversifying within syndicators would, would be a let's, good idea. Let's talk about that. Red flags, right? Let's say they're... First red flag? Yeah, go guy ahead. Guy throwing money. Biggest red flag, right? Like just spending like crazy? Yeah. I would have to say names, but some of the older term you know, real estate people, right? People have been doing this for 40 years, 50 years. We don't see them going and spending money like some of the younger people are doing it today. So to me, one of the biggest red flags 
is that guy who's throwing the overtop parties and basically having to scream that I have money usually means that 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 to me is like number one red flag. Okay. The other red flags that I that I see with you know with syndicators is how many deals has he done in the last year? How many deals is he doing all over the place? Can he focus? Remember track record, not track record so much because you can do bad deals, mm -hmm. right? If a syndicator comes to you and tells you, you know, I've only made money on my deals and I've had a twenty five percent return, doesn't that? It means he hasn't been through a down cycle, or he's burning money, right? <laughs> right. So you need it. everyone's going to have that deal where you did and you messed up, right? If you do enough deals, uh, you know, we've done enough work for some really big players to have bad deals, right? Even some of the biggest, you know. Jewish names that we can think of, right, without mentioning them, have had deals that for whatever reason just didn't work out, right? And then, you know what? To me, it's more important to see what they did when they had a bad deal than anything else. Were they willing to get out of it, take the loss, or did they hold on to, to it too long till they got nothing out of it? That's also something that's very, very important to seeing how they deal with it when, the, you know, when it hits the fan. Are they there or they're just, you know, what are you called? The other thing that I think is, you know, People tell me, you know, it's the third deal. I don't want to invest, All right? But what's the story behind it? I always ask, even on our non syndicated when a client brings me a deal, he asks the due diligence. I'm like, what's the story? All right? I got to understand the story. And once you can understand the story, why is the guy selling? What's going on with the property? All those things. Understanding the story is very, very important. And yes, if a guy tells you that I'm, I'm always buying deals that are 50% vacant, I'm going to get the 95% vacant, I'm doing this all the time. I've done this a dozen times. Those are usually the guys that scare me the most, all right? So, you know, there's, there's a guy that we're trying to help now where a guy came to tell him, oh, my brother got in trouble, so he can't, I can't sign on loans because of my last name. Can you sign the loan for me? And the person went and signed on like 13 or 14 loans for the person. That to me is like a huge red flag, right? If it's just your brother, go explain it, right? Or it's just this or just that. Obviously, there's much bigger issues. And now those issues are coming to the forefront and now there's a lot of problems. So you got to really see what's the story with the person, what's his track record, ask him, tell me a deal that didn't work out, what did he do? You know, obviously if a guy is doing his third or fourth deal, that's a problem, but like, wh what are you gonna do like, if not everything works out, what's he upon? You know, just because he's 26 years old and son, he's gonna go buy multifamily buildings, what do you do till now to get there, right? Have you, you worked with somebody, is that person going to, you know, go and vouch for you? Right, so let's say the guy says, oh, I've been working for the last five years for so-and-so, now I'm going out on my own. Great. Right. Right. Is that person going to go vouch for you? Because right, that person knows you. Now, he might be upset that you're going out on your own, but if, if he thinks that you're an honest person, he'll vouch for you as being an honest person. You have to see, like, it's, you know, I think it was just too easy a year or two ago just to go, oh, any guy can go buy deals. Right. In a rising market, it brings a lot of speculators in, and everyone and their mother became a syndicator a couple of years ago. And especially then with the way they financed, the way it works when a building is marketed, you'll have the experienced groups come in and say, we, we think this building is only worth $25 million. That's the most we can pay and still get our investors a good return. But then someone else can come flying in and say, hey, I can finance this with bridge debt. I can bet that the Fed is not going to raise rates at all. And I could pay $30 million and then they'll win, the, they'll win the deal. And they buy it for $30 million. They show investors whatever they want. Like Joseph said in Excel, you could do whatever you want. Make it make it look great. There's a line that there's more fiction that was written in Excel than in Word. So all you do is change a couple of inputs. It looks great. You raise the money, and you just hope brands rise. And unfortunately, a lot of those people that had that investment strategy are, are starting to pay the price. You got to be so careful. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, a message from Infinity Land Services. You know them. They've been a sponsor for a while. They understand the complexities of the real estate market. If you're looking for a smooth closing, you're looking for Infinity Land Services. You're going to get personalized service. They have attention and detail to everything along the way. And they have a real commitment to excellence. And basically, their track record speaks for itself. Visit ILSTitle.com. You'll see a recent list of their transactions, 
a lot of them very, very, very large. And if you're looking for stories and drama, do not go to ILSTitle.com. But if you're looking for someone passionate and someone who can get the job done, they've been at this for over two decades. That's literally over 20 years. They are the ones for you. Mark Hershkowitz, super awesome team. They're nice people. They're to the point. They get it incredible team ilstitle.com tell them your friends at kosher money sent you you will be thankful and now back to this week's episode so let's say someone's listening to this they're hungry they want to get involved in a deal but they don't know how to find a deal what are some tips that you have for people to find a good deal there there's a thousand deals out there on any given day all right if you're hungry to find deals deals will always come to you the problem is not is not getting deals. The problem is getting good deals and understanding what to look for and how do you look for it. So, like, if you ask, well, I would me, say, don't find a deal. Find a person. Find no, the guy. Find someone can, that has the experience that you just spoke about, and and be in touch with you them. You can't just do that because what happens is is that I don't care who you are. You sometimes are going to be blinded by what's going on and make a bad decision. So you need to do really both. You need to find the person that you trust, and then go look at the deal, or look at the deal and make sure that you trust the person. You can't, people just look at the person, you know, we're all fallible. Everyone, you know, makes mistakes. And, you know, we all have our own, like, outlook on things. And you got to really understand what the guy's doing, you know, all those things. So you can't just look at the person. I, I think that that's, like, the biggest, I've seen so many red flags of people just doing that. So I always say, you know, I personally like to look at the numbers first, and then I'll go look at the person. And then, you know, other people like to do it the other way around. But you have to look at each one of them equally. It could be the greatest guy out there, but the, the numbers just don't add up. They don't add up. It could be the so, so how's Ellie supposed to know that? Someone pitches him tomorrow in the coffee room. How is he supposed to know if these numbers are realistic projections, realistic assumptions or not? Well, first of all, you can look at what he's assuming. Go to someone else. You know, we started a program where we'll, we, you know, for not a lot of money, we'll do like a basic two-hour review for clients. Mm -hmm. right? But why do we start it? Because like, you have plenty of people out there who want to put in $100,000. They can't really afford to go spend a lot of money on the diligence. And, and you know, we do it for clients all the time on the small amounts. Obviously, if a guy's coming to us, like we have a client that came to us, he's about to put seven and a half million dollars in there. I'm like, I'm not allowing you to do it unless someone in my office goes down there. All right? We sent one of the guys down from my office. It turns out that the, the rent roll that we got was fake. Okay? Basically, in this state, the way it works is that you get evicted, you have 30 days to come back into the property. All right? So they did a whole bunch of evictions. They left those tenants on the rent roll because they have 30 days that they come up with the money to come back in. So the property was much less occupied than he was actually saying, mm. right? And this is like, you know, two guys who pray in the same synagogue and we're going to see each other afterwards. And this guy was willing to do it with his friend because he's in a bad situation and he needs to raise the money. And he did what he had to do. And he's optimistic he's going to... Correct. ...fill in that, that Correct. rent. You know? What would happen if a deal did go through that was later found out that the deal wasn't reflective of what was in those sheets so if you're well, willing it's, to it's the wild west go, it's the wild west nobody nobody's signing it these sheets are 100 percent accurate and i'm gonna sit in jail if they're not you could you could write whatever you want in an om i had two fbi agents in my office one friday morning about one of our clients and i told them the first thing i told them when we sat down with them right they came to me what this person did was of all the crimes that he's committed in his life what they're getting for is the most ludicrous thing but that's what they have them on fine you know, and they came to me and they asked me, okay, and I told them, you have to understand the first thing, all right? In real estate, unlike stocks, all right, there are no accounting rules. There are some basic guidelines, but it's not set forth, all right? And in real estate, it really is, even when you get an OM or from a memorandum from, let's say, from CBRE or any of the big firms out there, there are a lot of right things in there that are like, you know, that basically, that aren't even like reality. Right? Or you can do this, or you might be able to do this, or this might be a possibility, or you might be able to get this income. They're not saying that you can for sure get it. These are options for you. Maybe you can go buy it. Right? And we always laugh about it. And, you know, I explain to them, just my own stance on Real estate, there's nothing that's straightforward and honest. Now, what they, this guy got in trouble for is he, he took a proof of funds, edited it in Adobe, and sent it off to, a, to another party. Mm -hmm. All right? And we were laughing about it, but, you know, that's, they, they, they basically, we were on some of the emails. They wanted me to authenticate the emails. You know, I sat to my attorney, you know, I didn't really have a choice in the matter. And yeah, we were, we were the missing link in, in, that, in that chain. Fine. Great. But, you know, we were laughing about it after, they, they didn't understand, like, how real estate were, they looked at it as, like, everything's, like, so simple. 
right? And it's just like one set of rules, and it really isn't. So you have to know what you're looking at, why it is that way, unless you're a professional, right? It's very, very hard to do. So if you have a friend that's a commercial mortgage broker or someone else that's in real estate, you can ask them to, to do a deep dive on it. That might be your best option. And I'd add to that, when you see an offering memorandum, most of them don't include the rent roll. Some will, mm -hmm. but ask for the rent roll and ask also for what's called a T12, the, the trailing, trailing 12, 12 months of, of, of income. Now, and that's, a, that's its own thing. Like, but at least if you have those, you can see what you're buying on day one. You because, can't. Really well, like... well, well, that's better than not looking at those. Yes, that is because, true. Because if you're just looking at an offering memorandum, what you're looking at, you're looking at guesses, projections, assumptions, Optimism. but you don't even but you don't even know what those are coming off of. You don't know what it looks like today mm -hmm. to see if that guess of where rents or where expenses will be in a year from now are even somewhat realistic. So you want to know what you're getting into on day one before any changes, before any improvements are done to the property. I will say this, you know, we have caught syndicate, you know, sellers changing a T12. Right? And I could go into horror stories that we've had and things like that that we've done for clients where we're doing due diligence where we're like, you know, the guy, you know, our bar comes to us, okay, like, hey, go through all the stuff. And we're like, uh, these numbers were edited, you know, because we have different ways of figuring out what's real and what's not real and getting through that whole thing. And, you know, we've had cases where, you know, maybe should have been, should have been referred to authorities for things like that. So you, you can't assume, especially, you know, if you're in the same community, you think, oh, that guy's not going to mess me over. But at the end of the day, everyone's looking out for themselves. I'd like to think most people are good people, right? Uh, until money gets involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but, it, you know, everyone means well, and they have their, you know, it's like, even take T12 for a second, you mentioned that, right? There's a thing called the cash, and it's called, called the cruel. Mm -hmm. Cash means what actually came in that month and what was spent that month. The cruel basically allows you to say, let's say I had bills that came in in March, right? If I paid them in April, what is the bill really about? It's March bill, right? So everyone always sends you out the cruel. The cruel is not going to be as accurate as the cash bills. Then we've had times where they made more money on the cash side versus the cruel side. You have to be able to look at both of them and see what you're looking at. It doesn't take, you know, we, we in our office take in interns all the time. It doesn't take more than six weeks to train them to the point that they can see which deals are good or not, mm -hmm. right? So either, you know, watch some online material, go to someone who's a professional, ask them, you know, and things like that. That will make a huge, huge difference. Go, to, go ask, you know, if you're meeting a syndicator, okay, I want to talk to someone who's been in a deal with you and has exited with you. Mm -hmm. I want to know that you successfully exited a deal. So I want to know what happened. You went into the deal, so you bought in 2019, sold in 2021. What was the story behind it? Those are the type of things you want to know and go to someone who's already invested money with them. But we, the market we've had the last few years, you, everyone, everyone did well. So I have deals that clients did that were bad deals and they stole me money. It so it's not indicative of, a, of an operator that's good at what he does. But one thing that I will add about that is you can also ask a syndicator if he's sending you a deal is show me some of your reporting. Show me your investor reports of a couple of deals doing well and a couple of deals that are not doing well and see how detailed they are. Interesting. See, see what's, see. You That's know, actually a very good like. point. Like we, we, we write reports sometimes for clients sending out to their investors, you know, on deals. How often are they? Reports sent out usually quarterly. Usually quarterly. quarterly. Um, depending on the type of deal, that really that's true. Like if you have, like, say, a warehouse building, right. you might do it. You might do it every you know six months or every once a year because you have, let's say, long term leases right. or it's things like changing. that. You have to know what type of deal it is. We have deals that are multifamily. Where they actually send that reporting every month, mm. right? So they'll send their investors every month. What was this month's leasing? What's going on at the property? They'll send a three page thing as an email, which is great because I think that gives everyone a great chance to know what's going on, and they don't feel like I have no idea what's going on. They're, is, they're sending to lenders monthly, right? Most yes and no, time. but like we do that for mm -hmm. clients. The stuff you're sending to lenders, it's very, very... Basic? It's not basic. You send the, your monthly income expenses and things like that. There's no text. That. It's just numbers, mm -hmm. right? Numbers only can tell a certain portion of, of a story. Mm -hmm. So like lenders aren't really looking at... They're punching it into their systems and things like that, but they're not looking on a monthly basis that. So it's... You know, they're not looking at the overall story. I'm coming from visiting a property of a client of ours where they had six units down because they decided they're doing an upgrade program to try it out. So the, six units down, man. Say six units that aren't being rented right okay. now, because which is almost was a 5% of the, of, the, of the property because they decided we're going to try five units out to renovate them and see if we can get a higher rent. Okay. So if I just look at that, I'm going to say, oh, they had a higher vacancy last month. That's not really true because they took those five units offline for two months to renovate them. Right. 
So you need you need to get a little bit of text that goes along with it. But yeah, a good operator sends out reports, is updating his investors, has either monthly, quarterly conference calls with their investors, is constantly giving everyone information. If you're doing that, no one's perfect, right? We're all any guy who's doing this for long enough is gonna have bad deals, right? And you have to understand that going in, which is not more that you know you can go invest in public companies. Eventually, you know, as Elon Musk and uh, not sorry, Jeff Bezos says. One day, Amazon's going to go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. Right? I think it's like one of the things that they keep on pushing into the employee's head. It's just It can't happen on my watch. Mm-hmm. Right? Look at all the biggest companies, Kodak, or any of the big, huge companies that were around you know, 50, 100 years ago. A lot of them aren't around today. Take even a look at something like GE. Right? That was considered one of the best companies ever out there. You know, if I were told you in 2001 that GE would be like a quarter of what it was then today, you would look at me like I literally fell off the moon. I'm out of my cock and pick I mean, a line. You, you could have told me two months ago Google would be down today and with all the AI and so but so this is why it's important to diversify and not to pick a few hot stocks. Right. right. And this right. is why you have to understand something that eventually you're gonna have a deal that just doesn't go great. Right. And that's fine. And as long as you're diversifying and you understand that I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket, great. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk briefly about and I read Twitter threads about this, the, the depreciation, the tax benefits. Not for today. This... Not for today, but, but is there truth to it, right? Oh, Are... 100%. But I, I will tell you this. The quickest way to lose money yeah. is a 1031 exchange. That means buying. Basically, what happens is when you, if let's say I sell a property and I don't want to pay taxes on the sale, I buy a new property in its place. So if I sell the property for a million dollars, I buy a new property for a million dollars or even more, but I can right. get the cash in there. I always tell my clients. you're doing it for the building. You're not doing it you're for doing the You're doing it just investment. not to pay taxes. Right. Right? That if the only reason why you're buying the property is not to pay taxes, pay the taxes. So I, I'll add to that, that if we're talking about limited partners going into syndications yeah. because they expect tax benefits, right. everyone should ask their accountant, will they actually benefit if this property gives them what's called a, a K-1 tax loss, a passive right. loss, because... It's not so simple. The tax code is is very complex, and many okay, people will, life. many some people will benefit, some people won't. You should make sure that you actually will benefit. And I would add to that you mentioned depreciation. Depreciation is not a freebie that the government just says, "Hey, you don't have to pay taxes because because of depreciation." It's recapture. It's called, it, it, there's something called recapture, and when you sell, you you have to pay those taxes. I, I just want to so. say this back to the thing. But one of the best ways to create generational wealth is definitely real estate, right? You know, the question is, do you invest with somebody else? Do you do your own deals? How do we do that? But if you're just thinking about any, you know, if I bought a property 50 years ago somewhere, as long as I'm not in a place that now is totally deserted, I've made, you know, just look at, you know, our parents' houses and things like that. You create, there's there's a lot of generational wealth created in real estate. Well, that would be single family, but... But even in uh, office, in, 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 office, maybe not, but, but like in they, multifamily. Things change, and, and there are right. cycles, and a lot of people who had big portfolios in 06 and 07 didn't ha- have them a few years after that. Mm-hmm. Mainly do the one thing that kills a lot of syndicators or people in real estate is over-leveraging. We've seen even some... Oh, over so the only two things I can't... Well, it's really one. You can come to me... A lot of things in real estate I can fix. I cannot fix if you're over-leveraged or you overpaid. Right, is, is that once you're in that situation, there's nothing I can do about it. Mm-hmm. You have a deal that your management company messed up, right? And they're not doing a great job, but I have enough room to play with. We, we've been very successful with clients coming in there, beating up the management company, and you know, literally the deal I was at today, we did an unbelievable job of getting the managed company to focus. And now they're, you know, even in today's environment where rents are not growing, this mm-hmm. property has had on average, between 10 and 20% rent growth month over month for the last six months. Mm-hmm. And that went from a property that had major issues seven months ago. Mm-hmm. They're not over leveraged. They didn't really overpay for the property. There was enough time to get in there, fix the management company, and get done what needs to be done. If you're in a bridge loan and you, don't, you can't do that, then you don't give yourself the time. You're just chasing that clock. And once you're on that, once you're on that wheel, it's very, very hard. All right? It's hard to get off. You have to go down to capital calls. There's so many other issues. So yes, over leverage is, you know, obviously it's so much easier to take more leverage and not have to go out and raise more money. But the deals that, you know, end up making the most money don't have as much leverage and don't have, you know, if a syndicator wants to go out and raise, you know, 30% to 35% versus this 25, it's a better deal. It might dent your returns, but for overall, you're it's doing a much better. It's a better risk adjusted return. Yeah. 
right so obviously we can't paint all deals with one brush so if someone like if someone pitches you a different deal you see a few different deals look at the financing see is it bridge debt on a three-year term is it typical fixed rate debt of five years seven years maybe ten years see what the leverage is and you'll see that there's some deals that are a lot riskier potentially could turn out nicely and have more upside there are some deals that will be a lot safer with less upside and you'll see which one fits you a little bit better we could probably go on for hours hours what didn't we cover that's critical to cover in a 101 102 session i, I think something that i speak about whenever we did like seminars is like really understanding comps it's like it's one of the hardest things to learn but once you learn it it's so important understanding comparisons, understanding how things are valued and things like that that's, that i think you can spend hours explaining to people teach them how to do it that's very important the other thing is, is just basic understanding that you know how to read a financial statement it's not so simple and understanding like how things go above the line below the line and how the deal actually makes money i think is very very important i think it's also important to understand what you can control what you can't whereas people will say i know interest rates are going down next year or we'll buy now and we you know it's it's the rates will be lower and values will be more and people will tell you that they know for sure that cap rates are going to go down again nobody can control interest rates nobody can control cap rates you can't control if other supply is coming into your market so people have to understand that even the best operators they're limited to what they can control in the deal and the rest of it is just making sure that you position yourself nicely that regardless of what the market throws at you you'll be able to to make it through i do want to end with this i think it's very important we i posted this as a post a while back we're not the only company that does the diligence right there are other people out there you can go to just do me a favor go to somebody right you don't have to hire us uh you know but go to somebody sit down with somebody if i'm gonna think about it this way if you had fifty thousand dollars you know or even a hundred thousand dollars you agree with that right yeah you Speak gotta to go talk to somebody who's a professional in the industry yeah they're they're just, you know go back and find my linkedin post about it you gotta go to some you can't just rely on my, your own intuition because at the end of the day you you get Everyone gets like these blinders on. You right? see, you see, thirty-five percent IRR, and then you go, to, you know, you get excited. And, you know, that actually to me is a red flag, mm-hmm. right? You know, the best thing that can happen, like we did a due diligence project for a client, all right? And then a very large player decided he want, might want to go into the deal, mm-hmm. and he goes to us, "Where do you get your rent numbers? I think you're asking for too much rent." So I tell him, "Why don't you go to the apartments.com right now, see what they're asking?" Okay. Two months later, they were above asking rents in this building were above what we projected. And we projected those numbers to get there in 12 months. I'm like, if they're getting more today than I projected, do you think, the, uh, what do you think? He goes, wow, that's great. All right? It always pays. Be a little more conservative. You don't have to, not every deal has to be a 35% IRR. You know, I think someone once told me, I had always tried to find, I couldn't find, Goldman Sachs did a report back in like 2012. If you looked at real estate deals, on average, they returned around 8%. So yes, some deals return 30%, some deals return 2%, some deals lost money. But on average, a good deal is going to return on average yearly 8%, uh, you know, an IRR, an internal rate of return. Now, there are plenty of guys who have done deals that are much better than that, you know. And I always tell my clients, do you want a guy, some syndicators go for singles, some syndicators go for grand slams. Probably when you go for grand slams, you strike out also. So on the overall basis, if I hit three, four grand slams, and I strike out five times, you know, the guy's doing great. But if you only invested the five deals they struck out and weren't in the three deals that hit a grand slam, you see this guy walking around with all his money, but you didn't, you didn't get any of it. Versus some guys want to go into you know, deals that are much safer, lower returns, and you know, steady eddy deals. So you have to know, you know what's your risk return reward profile and all that. So people always say you know, real estate, 20% IRR, or 25 or more, they, they won't go into a deal if it's less than that. But I got a question for you, Ellie. There's plenty of 30-year-olds walking around with $500,000 to invest. Assuming they never invest a dime again, if they got 20% a year every year till they hit 75, where do you think they'd end up? They started with 500,000, they got 20% a year, they never added to it. Where do you think they'd be 45 years later when, they, when they're 75? In a very wealthy place. Take a guess, take a guess. I wanna hear a number. 20%, 500,000, 30 years? 45 years. 45 years? The guy who's 30 till he's 75, where do you think he's going to end up at the end of his life? Tens of millions of dollars. Not, not so much, because he's earning 20% a year, but the actual base didn't go up so much. 
You said no, but tens he started, of million. He started early, so I don't know. Uh, no, but his pace is not changing. He's saying the pace when, when it's over, no. it's over half a million dollars. It's just he made every year made money on his money. Every no, year. and it was if that compounds twenty percent a year. Yeah. Oh, compound is very that's, different. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. He, this guy earned twenty percent a year. Forty two million dollars. One point eight billion dollars. Now, there's plenty of people walking around with five hundred thousand dollars to invest. I walk around. I don't. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see too many people that are worth one point eight billion at the end of their lives. So. A 20% return to expect that is just not realistic. Now, compounding, you've had multiple advisors talk about how that works when you have the benefit of time and starting young, but 500000 at 10% a year, let's say a, you know that's a typical return, that would give, give you, I think it's 30 or $40 million mm -hmm. in that range. So yes, you can do very nicely, but if, any, if everyone was able to really get 20% so easily, there'd be a lot, of, a lot more billionaires walking yeah, around right now. Yeah, it's more short term, you know. <laughs> To get those returns, you got to sell. Right. Uh, also, when you see IRR on an OM, that's assuming that every distribution you got was immediately reinvested at that same rate. So if someone invests in real estate deals and they're getting a quarterly check, they need to have a plan what to do with that if they really want to grow that money. If they're just going to go take that and spend it on meat boards and who knows what else, they're not going to hit that, those returns. Awesome. Well... We do have like eight other things to discuss, and I want you both to clear your LinkedIn uh, inbox because oh, you I, will, got, I uh, got enough, you know, stuff there. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, uh, enjoy the many hundreds that are coming in. Um, but really, as long as they're not trying to sell me anything, it's fine. I can't promise that either. <laughs> thank you guys both so much for coming in, taking, taking the drive down, and we appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Kosher Money. I'm your host, Ellie Langer. We are the Living L'Chaim Network. Many shows, check out our YouTube channel. If you have Spotify, we really can use some more five-star reviews. So head over to Spotify, regardless of whether or not you listen there. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review there as well. If you want to learn more about Kosher Money, guest suggestions, sponsorship opportunities, hit us up, livinglechaim.com. Thank you to our friends at Living Smarter Jewish. Org. If you need a financial coach, advice, guidance, you're in a bad place and you're looking for a resource, visit livingsmarterjewish.org. You can email them, info at livingsmarterjewish.org. That is head up by Zevi Woolman, an awesome dude. Thank you for all you do, Zevi. Thank you to our friends at Mishpacha Magazine. Our episodes are now being written up with bonus content on mishpacha.com. You'll see videos there, bonus content. Pick up a fresh magazine. You will thank us later. Thank you to our sponsors, Infinity Land Services. Approved funding and Kolel Chabad. Links for them are in the show notes. Support our sponsors. Support us. Thank you for listening. Like I say, if you have feedback, don't be shy. We take all forms of feedback and we appreciate you. We're also going to put our hotline phone number. So if you have a cousin who does not have access to the internet, you can actually get this, call a phone number and listen from a landline, a cell phone. If you're in the car driving and you don't have access to the internet, but you have access to a phone, you can listen to our episodes via a hotline. And it's kind of cool. We're getting hundreds of listens and the phone number is in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I talk way too much in these outros, but I appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Living L'Chaim.